All right, good evening. I'd like to uh, welcome everybody back after an afternoon off. Hopefully you caught a nap, did something restful, read some books. I know we got some people go to the bookstore, uh, a lot of different things going on. So uh, it's good to be back here. I've been so happy with the way the conference has gone so far. Um, just a, a couple brief words about tonight. Where did I put my, here it is, okay. So we're going to start here uh, shortly with asking uh, Matt Hawley to come back up, and he's going to bring his second message of the weekend titled Prepping Media and Scripture, Assessing the Battle for Your Family. So Matt is going to be addressing that. When he is done, we will have a short uh, transition, to, and then we'll have some music here. I think we're going to have some sing-along. Is that right? Or is it more of a concert format? Okay, so it'll be a mix of, of both, and then when the when that's over, we'll put the ice cream out and turn the ball game on out in the fellowship hall, but uh, we, we want to honor the musicians and not turn the game on until after uh, that portion of our time together is over. So we have a lot going on. I did want to say, and I want to wish the Donaldsons a uh, happy anniversary, Blake and Amy, their anniversary is today or tomorrow? Today. 16 years uh, of marriage for them. They've been a part of the assembly now for quite a long time, and we want to make sure that we congratulate them on that. The conference has almost always fallen on your anniversary, right? So it's a good way to celebrate your anniversary. So I don't want to take up Matt's time. So Matt, if you come up, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say from the Word this evening. Well, good evening. Thank you again for the opportunity to, to come and teach. It's always a privilege when you get to stand before people and teach God's word. So hopefully tonight as, as we address these issues, um, we'll learn something from God's word. All right. So let me uh, read to you what I'm supposed to go over. All right. So the title of my message is Prepping Media and Scripture, Assessing the Battle for Your Family. And four, four things that I'm supposed to go over, uh, that uh, we will go over, is, is it scriptural for believers to be preppers? How do we balance being prepared with being obsessed? Discuss how overindulgence in news and social media impacts one's personal thinking and family dynamics. How can we protect our families from evil without unnecessarily scaring them or causing them undue anxiety? And uh, then some scriptures that we're going to go over is we're going to end up looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and Philippians chapter 8, but I'm sure as you suspect, there'll be a lot more scripture to go over than that. So let's start with a word of prayer, and we'll get right into this. Father, again, we thank you that we can come together. We thank you for your word, and I pray that as we uh, study your word, that we'll gain understanding. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. I want to read you... Some bits out of an article from February 6, 2011. Let me say this before we get into this. Um, out of the three messages that I prepared, I, I would say this one was the hardest one to think through and the hardest one to, to get through. So um, some of the things that I'm going to give you are good questions to ask more than answers. So whenever you get into things in Scripture sometimes that maybe we don't have a great answer for, what we have to do is use what Scripture we do to come up with better ways to think about things. So we're, we're going to address that and look at some things that way. But, so, this article is how your worldview and preparedness mindset are influenced by your eschatology. Now, eschatology is your view of future events, scripturally, right? So the, the title of the article is that your worldview and your preparedness mindset are influenced by your eschatology. Now, uh, just to cite where this came from, this came from somebody who doesn't fully identify themselves other than their initials, but this was posted on the survival blog. And uh, I don't know if you know anything about the survival blog, but it's run by a Christian fellow named James Wesley Rawls. And if you're into preparedness, you'll know who that is. If you're into 
if you're into the Christian side of things, uh, on the preparedness end of things, you, you, you'll know who that is. If, if you don't know who that is, you just have to go to Survival Blog and find out, I guess. That's not a commercial for it, but that's just a statement. But I want to read you just a couple sections of this to kind of frame some things that it's important to know. It says, since the Second Great Awakening, a time of spiritual revival and activity in the 1830s, the Christian church has embraced the theology of pessimism. Now, David talked about that last night when he went over dominionism and Christian nationalism. This theology of pessimism. Now, as I keep reading, it says, This time of revival saw a clear shift in end-time belief or eschatology. The traditional and historical view of the church was dominion theology, which is quickly making a strong return today through the Reformed move, Christian movement. So, he says, let's explore both thoroughly so we can understand how one's position of eschatology will ultimately define their worldview and their preparedness mindset. So it's easy for me to tell you that your eschatology determines how you think about the way you live your life on the earth, right? But instead of setting up a straw man and saying, hey, let's knock down the way people think, I think it's always good to just read from the source, right? So what this, that first paragraph told you was some interesting things that you... If you believe in dispensationalism, according to dominionism, believe in a theology of pessimism. And that theology of, is considered a theology of pessimism by dominion theology because it believes that there's a course to this world and that we're supposed to be delivered from this present evil world. So they say it's pessimistic. Because the outlook for this world isn't good. And quite frankly, <laughs> the outlook for this world isn't good. So the next thing that it does is it says that dominion theology is quickly making a strong return through the reformed Christian movement. Um, now I'm sure Brian's talked about the reformed Christian movement, so I don't need to spend much time time in that. But what I want you to see is that preparedness, according to this article, not according to me, eschatology, dominion theology, and reformed theology all work together in a package, according to this author. And it works in a package that is against the theology of pessimism. Now this article is 12 years old. Now let me ask you something. Has the reformed movement gained or lost ground in the past 12 years. They've gained ground. So this is kind of old information. I want to read you something else. It says, the pessimism, the pessimism plays out in our worldview and culture. This is the exact reason the Christian church today is vastly impotent and useless in affecting our culture for Christ and has no cause for impacting future generations. Why would someone be interested in two or three generational plan of attack when they continually are looking for the, to the sky for the exit? A modern church has a lack of gener generational purpose and is waiting for the mothership to come take her away. That's rough. I don't think it's a mothership. I'd say it's Jesus Christ coming in the clouds. <laughs> One more line. The Christian church made a left turn in the 1830s, and it's time to get back on track. So the challenge is to read these, this, referring to a list of books that he gave you, that he said have yet to be answered. By the way, when somebody says something has yet to be answered, you know that's a disingenuous statement because there's nothing out there theologically that hasn't been answered in some way, shape, or form, correct? It just hasn't been answered to the author's standard. <clears throat> So the challenge is to read these, these books that he references, and not be convinced of the, falsi the falsity of dispensational premillennialism. All right? So I bring that to your attention for this reason. I agree with the author. By the way, the, the, the ultimate point of the article I don't think is bad. Um, but the article itself 
It's pretty rough on dispensationalists. But the reason I bring that up is because even the other side of the aisle sees that eschatology affects how you, how you behave today, right? How you look at what's going to happen in the future determines how you behave today. And I think that's an important thing to understand, even if the other side brings it up and they're advocating for something else. When I say other side, I mean dominion theology. But that does bring us to the point and to the, one of the questions that I'm supposed to answer. Is it scriptural for believers to be preppers? How do we balance being prepared with being obsessed? So let's talk about that for a few minutes. And, and while I talk about it, some of this is going to be my pontification as well. So you are more than welcome to disregard anything that doesn't come out of the scripture. But I don't think the question of is it a good thing to be prepared is necessarily, it, who would say it's a bad thing to be prepared, right? Is it a good thing to be prepared generally for things in life? It is, right? It, it, it's, it's good to be prepared. Now, when you get to the question of prepping itself, if you say, I want to answer whether somebody should be a prepper or not, you're really asking a question of degrees because we all, act, we, we all believe that preparedness is a good thing, correct? So let me ask you this. If you have a family... Is life insurance a good thing to have? Absolutely. Because something tragic could happen, and your family needs to be taken care of, so it's important in that situation to be prepared. Is it important to save money so that you have money when you need money? It is. So when I think of prepping in general, and by the way, if you haven't noticed, I, I might lean that way a little bit in the way I think about these things. I think prepping in general is just really a question of insurance. So then it then becomes a question of how much do I need? And the question of how much do I need, I do think, takes some scriptural verses that we have and how are we supposed to think about the life that we have and how are we supposed to think about the responsibilities that we have and how do we weigh those things? So let's attempt to do that a little bit, right? It's important to realize... I'm, I'm going to just throw out some personal experience here. Last year, Christmas time, bad snowstorm, Dayton, Ohio. April and I decide to go get groceries. There isn't a single thing in the store, okay? There's not a single thing in the grocery store. Matter of fact, the storm was bad enough that the doors were frozen open, right? And I remember driving there, and we got there, and, and we didn't, we weren't hungry. Like, we, oh, we need groceries, and there's no bologna around. It wasn't anything serious like that. But what it showed is that one instance of panic, and that store was empty. Now, I don't know about you, but having... 24 to 48 hours of food in the grocery store itself is a little kind of a scary thought. Because on the way there, you know what I didn't see? I didn't see a place to get food, right? Is that something that's legitimate to consider? That, hey, maybe I should have some things in my house so that if that situation happens again, I don't have to worry about it. I can weather that. Of course, that's a reasonable thing to think. More personal experience. I'm in a third world country. And as I go through the third world country, the entire drive, there's people standing in the street selling food. There's cattle in the median. There's mangoes hanging off of trees. There's roadside stands the whole way. And then when you get out into the areas that you're going to, there's food and markets and it's, it's, it's all there within walking distance. And I, I looked at that, and I thought, I contrasted that against the storm and progress. And I thought, okay, we're, we're, we've, we've got progress here. But we also live in a very complicated system that is somewhat delicate. 
that it doesn't take much to disrupt that system. And on my way to the grocery store, there's not a mango tree. Right? So I look at those things and I say, do I understand that mindset? Do I understand that, hey, maybe I should think about the state that we're in and, and be prepared for it? I absolutely do. And I do think that there is a reasonable amount of preparedness. And I'm not going to dare stand up here and tell you what that is for you. Right? But let's get into, let's get into some, some things that I think are important. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Some of these were referenced by Dave this morning. But that's okay. We can hear the same verse twice, right? 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8 says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Is it my responsibility to take care of my house? And as Dave outlined this morning, is it my responsibility to go to work to take care of those things, to make sure that that happens, to make sure that I have income, and to make sure that I have resources to reasonably provide for my family? Now, there are always situations that you could say you can't reasonably provide for, correct? Some of those things may be certain amount of civil unrest, natural disaster, man-made disaster, economic collapse. There's some things that I don't know if there's any amount of preparedness that's going to take care of it, right? Just to go to the extreme, a nuclear blast. Okay? It takes an awful lot of preparedness to make it through that guy. So we can always think of a situation that we can't do or we're not going to be able to make it through, but it is our responsibility to reasonably provide for our family the best that we can. Now go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Just go, go one over. Now this is something that should influence our thinking. And I'm going to bring out something, I'm just going to bring out something at the beginning that I think is going to be a theme throughout this whole thing, that it is important for us to take in doctrine so that we're prepared for situations spiritually, in many cases, more than it is for us to be physically prepared for everything. Okay? Now, you might say, well, wh what do you mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is when, when we look at things like 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and Paul has a thorn in his flesh, ultimately what happens is Christ's strength is demonstrated through that weakness. So without understanding that, there are traumatic things that happen in everyday life that can be devastating to people if you don't have the right doctrine to prepare you for it. For example, if you think that God is punishing you by flat tires, then that can make for a really bad day, and it can make for a really big problem in my life when I, God's just punishing me all the time because things are bad. But when I realize that my blessings are in heavenly places and that I, lived in a, I live in a sin-cursed earth, now I have some, some fortitude to be able to deal with that. 1 Timothy chapter 6 says this, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to, joy, to enjoy. There's something that's very comforting in that verse. And... You might not think it's comforting, but it says, charge them that are rich in this world. And if you're here or you're listening to me, most likely you're rich in this world, right? You say, well, I'm not rich. Well, compared to all of history and all of humanity, we have more. And we have a different experience than I don't know what the percentage is, but if I was going to make up a number, 99.9% .9 of all human history, we're up there in riches. So this verse says, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches. It tells us that our riches are what? Uncertain. They're fleeting. But the, in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Now, verse 19 is a fascinating verse because it says, 
laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Now, in that verse, it says laying up in store. All right, that's prepping, right? This is doctrinal prepping. There's, there's, there's something that we're supposed to do here. We're going to lay up in store for ourselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. And that statement, lay hold on eternal life, means if you and I have eternal life, we should lay hold on it, right? Eternal life, we always think is something that's out in the future, but in Christ, eternal life is now. And we need to look at things that way. And we need to look at things from the standpoint of, are we to redeem time? We are to redeem time. Now, simple question. Your life is going to end by death or the rapture, correct? When is that? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know when that's going to happen. But what I do know is that Life is like a vapor. It's here and it's gone. And what's more important is laying hold on that eternal life. So as I think about the idea of redeeming time, there is always good things that I can do with my life. I can go pick up trash. Is that a bad thing? It's a good thing, right? But if I have a very limited amount of time, and I said, I could go pick up trash, or I could go teach the word, which would be the better use of my time? The teaching of the word, right? Because what that's going to do is that has an eternal impact. So it gives me, it gives me, it gives me perspective that life is short. And here's another truth. Go to Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. I'm, you know this verse. You might just be able to quote it. It says, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. All right? For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. I don't think I need to tell you this, but you, as a believer, if you've trusted in Christ, if you've trusted in his death, burial, and resurrection for forgiveness of your sins, we've already gone over that eternal life starts now. We're forgiven of all trespasses. We're complete in him. All of those wonderful things. But one of the things that you gain is a very unique relationship with death. Right? What do I mean by that? Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. And look at verse 15. It says, And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. What is that bondage? The fear of death. The fear of death is a, is a, is a, is a bondage according to the scriptures, right? Now, in all of human history, the dispensation of grace, I would say we have the most clear, sure, understanding of how salvation works because we have the completed scripture so we can look at the scripture we can gain so much understanding just by sitting there and looking and reading the word about salvation and that gives us a very unique perspective on death to where the apostle Paul can says for me to live is Christ and to die is gain what does that tell you it tells you that his efforts of self-preservation have some sort of limit because to die is gain And that's a funny way to look at life to the world, right? It is. It's a funny way to look at life to the world. But, man, praise the Lord that we have a different relationship when we look, with, look at death. We can look at death and say, well, death is a bad thing. But God took on the form of man for what reason? So that he could suffer death to defeat death. 
that view of me, that, that view to me, it, it, it makes me, and this might be a controversial thing to say, it makes me understand that the preservation of my life has limits to some point. Because for me to live as Christ and to die as gain, I don't have to fear death in the way that Hebrews chapter 2 and that most of humanity has. Now, I need to get into media a little bit. And I think all of these things tie together. So how do, how do we discuss the overindulgence in news and social media and the impacts of one's personal thinking? And by the way, none of these subjects are going to be separated, meaning as we move forward in the next 34 minutes, as we move forward, all of these subjects tie together into one ball. But go to Acts chapter 17. I want to give you two things to think about. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17 and verse 21. Acts 17 verse 21. For all the Athenians and the strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. Ooh, that's a great description of social media, right? They spent their time doing nothing else but either to tell or hear something new. If I had to count how many times I checked my phone to find out something new in a day, I would be shocked. And I don't want the answer, so I'm not going to count. But that is a perfect example of this Athenian mentality that there's something new that I need to know. There's something new that I, I've, got, I've got to have it. I've got to understand. Now, go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, because, or 1 Timothy chapter 4, and I'm going to actually just speed up talking a little bit so I can get through everything. But 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6 the Apostle Paul, talking to Tim Timothy, says, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. What is a good minister going to do? According to that verse. Give somebody something new, right? No, what are they going to do? They're going to put people in, in, in remembrance of things. Then he says, it's nourished up in the words of faith, good doctrine to refuse profane and old wives' tales. And then he tells him in verse 13, till I come, give attendance to reading, exhortation, and doctrine. And then he says in verse 15, meditate upon these things, give thyself halfway to them, holy to them, that thy, thy profiting might appear to all. Take heed unto thyself, and to the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Now, verse 8 has something interesting too. It says, for bodily exercise is profit, profiteth little, little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. That's a great verse for thinking about redeeming the time. Because what it tells you is that godliness is profitable when? Now. And in the life to come. So I get a two for one deal. Using their, old langu their own language. If, it's, if my life is simply about bullets, beans, and band-aids. In case I run into bad problems. That's only good for this life. But what is godliness good for? This life and the the life to come. So it tells me some things about that. And the, the other opposite of that is this remembrance, give attendance to. When he says give attendance to, what does that mean? Show up to spend time reading. Show up to spend time in doctrine. And show up to spend time... Sorry, I lost my place. Take heed... Or, Give attendance to reading, exhortation, and to doctrine. And verse 16, he says, after telling him to meditate, and that's not transcendental meditation, it's the opposite. Transcendental meditation tells you how to empty your mind. The scriptures tell you to fill it. 
with good things. Take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine and continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Well, what are they, what's he going to save himself from? And what is he going to save them that hear thee from? Well, that's verse 1. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and to doctrines of devils. So he says, if you don't want to fall into this trap, what you've really got to do is not look for new things, but you've got to put yourself in remembrance through the reading, the doctrine, and the exhortation, and the meditation, and you've got to spend things on things you most likely already know so that you stay away from these things. It's a different thinking. Oh, i got to have something new. No, I need, I need to renew my mind. And I renew my mind for something that's old, old information, and likely things that I already knew. You ever read, this, you ever read the Bible and you're like, oh, I forgot that. And I can tell in my life I forgot that because of the problems that have arisen from forgetting it. That's how the scriptures work in us. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. This is one of the verses I'm supposed to go over. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Fascinating, fascinating verse. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So he says there that in verse 4, the weapons of our warfare aren't carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Ephesians 6 tells you the same thing. But then it says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. You know what that tells you? That, that much, if not all, of spiritual warfare is fought where? Here, right? It's, it's fought here by putting the word in there. And here's something true. And this is, this is a question that gets back to the question of prepping as well. And to what degree am I going to participate in those things? That's something you answer, not me. But when I think about, when I think about spiritual warfare, Satan wants you out of the battle. Right? And if I was going to say, how do I get someone out of the battle? I think we're given some examples of that. So go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. How do I take someone out of the fight? So if I can figure out how Satan would take somebody out of the fight, then I can figure out how I should stay in the fight. Pretty simple, right? So it's 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. And you got to... Poor Demas, immortalized in Scripture here. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, and Titus till the, unto Dalmatia. So uh, how did Demas get taken out of the fight? He loved this present world, right? His priority was to preserve whatever he had in this present world and forgot about the life which is to come. It's the opposite of laying hold on eternal life. And all of a sudden, he's out of the fight. So then the next question is, Satan does want us out of the battle. But the next question is, go to 2 Timothy, are we in 2 Timothy 4? We are. Verse 6. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. For, now, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. So what does Paul mean by that? He's going to die. It's, it's, it's about done. And he says in verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So if, if I can determine how Satan would take me out of the fight, and I can see that Demas was taken out of the fight, and I can see that the Apostle Paul says that he's fought a good fight, then what I could do is look at the life of the Apostle Paul and say, 
that's a good fight, right? And I could say, I could get to the end of my life, and if I did what he did, I could say, that was a good fight. And in the process of that, at any point in time, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So whatever that happens, it's still gain, and it's still a good fight. That's kind of the idea of laying hold on eternal life. Right? I'm not going to put off living in Christ until it's a good time for me to live as Christ, to do it now and to die as gain. That way I don't have to worry about those things. So with that thinking, what I would like to do, and, and, and we're going to run backwards a little bit. We're going to look at the end of Paul's life, and he says, I've fought a good fight. So my thinking is, is, well, let's look at how he fought that fight and let's run some things back a little bit and maybe we'll find some foundational things about a good fight and how we should think about that fight. Everybody following the mess that's going on up here? <laughs> so if you will, go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians, well, let's go to Philippians chapter 4. Since we're working backwards, we might as well start in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. That's a hard verse to follow, isn't it? Verse 5, it gets a little tougher here. Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. What is moderation in that verse? This, this is really going to get the, at, at the heart of the consumption of media. Moderation in this verse is not how much you eat or how much you don't eat. It's not, it's not a question of that. The moderation in this verse is actually explained in the next verse when it says, be careful for nothing, verse 7, and the peace of God. And then he tells them that the things that they're supposed to think on. The moderation is the absence of the highs and the lows, and it's the moderation of understanding of who you are in Christ and the peace that that brings and how that should bring some level things to your life, right? Let me give you an example. If you want to relax, the best thing to do is to turn on talk radio, right? Because you listen to talk radio and you say, you know what? Man, I just love life. Everything's wonderful. I feel at peace. So maybe it doesn't work with talk radio. So we'll just turn on the TV news and you sit there and you're like, oh, I'm so moderate right now, right? That's not how it works. What do those things do? They spike your emotion to a point where <laughs> you're angry and foul. And you think about, in the scripture, the term fierce. That's what that produces. It doesn't produce moderation. It doesn't produce peace. It doesn't produce being careful and if those are the things that Paul says, and when Paul says, let your moderation be known unto all men, you know what moderate is? Walking into a town, getting stoned, they think you're dead. They drag you out, and what do you do the next day? You walk in and you do it, the, you do it again. <laughs> I, I think about that, and I think, that, that took some peace, that took some moderation, that took some courage to do those kinds of things. He, there, there had to be... From a human standpoint, there's something off when somebody does something like that, right? When you walk into a town, you preach the gospel, you get stoned, people think you're dead, and then you just go back and do it again. There, there's something, there's something from a, a human survival perspective that says that's off. The only thing that can explain that is a different view of death, right, that we already went over. But let's back up a little bit, because if you're at Philippians, I told you we're going to run backwards, so 
I know it's a little different, but follow me. Philippians chapter 4, verse 1 says, Therefore, my dearly beloved, my longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, dear, my dearly beloved. Whenever we read therefore in the scripture, what are we supposed to do? Look back and say, what's he talking about? Verse 17 of chapter 3. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. So this is interesting because Paul said he fought a good fight, but you could say to yourself, well, that's the Apostle Paul. He had a pretty special, special job. He can do those kinds of things, but I shouldn't because I'm not as special as he is. But what happens when, when you read verse 17, Philippians 3, verse 17, he says, brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. So what this does is this takes the thinking of, I've fought a good fight, and he says, mark them which have done what I've done, and, and what you should do is follow those people. But not only that, I mean, follow me, but also follow the people that do what I do. So you get this idea. It's very similar to commit thou to faithful men who will teach others also, right? So there's going to people, be people that walk like Paul and do what he does. And he says what he did was a good fight. So therefore, I should mark them and follow them. Now, what he also does for us is he tells us in verse 18, For many walk of whom I have told you often... And now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame. Now this last one's a hard hitter. What's it say? So he says, if you want to walk opposite of, I, of what I'm doing, and he says, please don't do this. He says, I tell you even weeping. It shows you the compassion that he had. He says, what you should do is not let your God be your belly. Not let your belly be your God. What does, what does that mean? That's about your consumptions, right? It's about your appetites. And not just our physical appetite. But the appetite of the things that our mind dwells on. The appetite that are things that our, our flesh wants to consume. And by the way, your flesh likes doom and gloom. Did you know that? <laughs> it does. I mean, there's a whole industry out there and at this time of year that makes money off of death and the promotion of it. And people love it. But what that tells us is your God, don't follow whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, and, and who mind earthly things. We're not supposed to do that. Well, why aren't we supposed to do that is the next question. Well, because if, 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 if we don't do that, if, if, if we walk that way, I'm sorry, if we walk that way and we, we mind these earthly things, what ends up happening is ultimately we don't end up fighting a good fight. We end up with the Demas problem of getting given over to the cares of this world. Back to verse 15. Verse 15 of chapter 3. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. So if we're going to be perfect, which is talking about being mature, there's a specific mind that we need to have. And that's verse 14, which is I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And he goes through and tells us what that is in verses 11 through 13. Now, I want you to back up to Philippians chapter 2. Because in Philippians chapter 2, as we've followed 
Paul and we followed his thinking, we come backwards to Philippians chapter 2, verse 16, where it says, Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Is that, a, is that a reference to a good fight? He's saying, hey, when I get to the end of my life, I don't want it to have been in vain. So what's the activity that keeps that from being in vain? The holding forth the word of life, right? The holding forth the word of life. Now, how does this, how does this start to fit in to what we're thinking about with the consumption of media and the battle for our family and even, even to prepping to some degree, when we look at these things, what it tells us is that if life is finite and I want it to be a good fight, then I have to take that finite time and I have to prioritize it. And if I'm going to prioritize that time, as a believer who understands the word, rightly divided, and understands a clear gospel, you're valuable to the ministry. So everything that we consume and take our time to deal with earthly things is, and this is just truth, and it's, it's hard truth, I think, for me to swallow and for you to swallow that everything that we participate in on an earthly level is in some way competing with the things that we should be participating in for an eternal level. Now there's a way that you reconcile that. I have to go to work every day, right? And um, some days you work, you work a lot, and you work hard, and you're trying to provide for your family. And you say, well, maybe that's, I'm going to use other people's words, are you in full-time ministry? Well, yes, I am in full-time ministry, and so are you. <laughs> Right? Be, because the scripture teaches us that, as Dave taught us, that working for our, an employer does not mean that we're outside of ministry. But what we can do is bring, bring some eter, in, eternal value to that. Well, how do we do that? Well, by holding forth the word of life. That should be, that should be the primary focus. Verse 15, back to Philippians chapter 2. Verse 15 that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. So what are we supposed to be? Blameless and harmless. And what are we supposed to do? Shine as lights in the world. So let's back it up to verse 14. Might as well. And this is something that talk radio produces. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Right? And, and a little bit of sarcasm there. <laughs> but does, does the consumption of media teach us to do all things without murmurings dispute, or disputings? Or does it just teach us to be angry? <laughs> does it produce moderation? Is it, is it and I'll read it to you, is it, are, are those things that I, I can participate in and in good conscience say, well, this is honest and just and pure <laughs> and lovely, <laughs> That's a harder one to get over. Uh, good report, virtue, and praise. I'm not going to think on this. Is that what, where, where do we even find those things? We find those things in the scripture, correct? I want to back it up a little further <laughs> to uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the, also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. So as, as Paul goes through this thinking where he says, hey, 
I, I want you to rejoice in the Lord. I want you to be moderate. I don't want you to be careful for things. I want you to have the peace that passeth all understanding. Those verses are actually the result of chapter 1 all the way to there, where he's actually given you an outline of his thinking of this is how I think about things. And at the end of chapter 3, he says, find people that think about things this way and follow them. And in doing so, you, you actually get to see, if you will, his entire philosophy and mission for life. And chapter 2 is key to this because he says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, glory but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. So how does he, he looks at other people and what does he do? He esteems them better than themselves. If you will, turn to Philippians chapter 4 again. He says in Philippians chapter 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 16, he says, rejoice evermore. And by the way, in verse 17, he says, pray without ceasing. Now, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Second Corinthians chapter 1. This is another verse that, that points to Philippians chapter 2. And it's going to point to his, I fought a good fight. To give us an idea of how to think about life on this earth. And I'm going to start to wrap it up with this. But in verse 12 he says, for our rejoicing is this. So we're told to rejoice. We're told to rejoice in the Lord always. We're told to rejoice evermore. And Paul's going to tell you very simply what his rejoicing is. He says, for our rejoicing is this. The testimony of our conscience that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we had our conversation in the world. And what's his conversation? Is that just the talk that's coming out of his mouth? No, that's his manner of life. We've had our conversation in the world. And then the last one is the real kicker. And more abundantly to you word. That's the Philippians chapter 2 to esteem others more highly than we esteem ourselves. So what am I getting at here? It is, it's in the best interest for you and your family to consume less media. Is that a controversial statement? Shouldn't be. But what does that need to be replaced with? It needs to re be replaced with the holding forth the word of life. But it's not just as simple as holding forth the word of life because the holding forth the word of life indicates that you're doing it for a reason. You're not holding forth the word of life just so you can walk in circles and stare at it, right? You're holding forth the word of life because your conversation in this world should not be in fleshly wisdom but simplicity and godly sincerity and more abundantly, you word. It should be about the ministry to others. It shouldn't be about just the selfishness of me and preserving me because that's not the mind that was in Christ. What did he do? He laid down his life for you and I. What do the scriptures tell you and I to do in Romans chapter 12? Verse 1. To offer our bodies as what? A living sacrifice. Now, as we do that, Guess what we're doing? We're fighting a good fight. We're going to be able to get to the end of, the life, our, end of our life and say, you know what? I fought a good fight. Now, how does, that, how does that, why do I tie that into prepping? It's obvious of why you tie that into media, but why do I tie it into prepping? Because I think those questions determine how much time you put into that compared to how much time you're going to put into ministering to others. That doesn't mean that 
being prepared for your family isn't putting time into others, correct? It's just a question of value of how much am I going to spend of this earthly thing to preserve this earthly thing? And is it more, is it a better way to spend my time to put in my fi- the finite time on this earth to not only affect what goes on in this life, but to affect what goes on in eternity? Well, if this life is short, then it makes sense to put more effort into that which is going to work out for eternity. We can look at the life of Paul, and you can actually look at it and say, hey, this is, this is, this is what a good fight looks like. And Philippians is a great place to do that. Actually, tomorrow we're going to spend more time in Philippians as, as we actually continue in this subject. But I hope that that, that at least stimulates your thinking to say, how should I look at some of these things? How should I look at the consumption of media? How should I look at a, a preparedness mindset? And um, what else should I be looking at? What am I missing? Those are all questions we need to ask ourselves. Let's end with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, what a, what a wonderful thing you've done for us through the gospel. And not only that, Lord, not only have you saved us from hell, but you've saved us from vanity and from a vain life. And I pray that we take what little life that we have and we do what we can for eternity with it. And we thank you for giving us the privilege to even do that. It's in your name we pray. Amen.